Welcome to Timeless Tales, History, and Folklore. I'm Dayanara, your host. If you're intrigued by tales, history, and folklore, subscribe and press the notification bell so that you'll be notified each time I upload a new video. Today, rather than try to figure out the murky details and theories of the different St. Valentines and reasons for which they were martyred, I decided to talk about four tales of tragic love since we're close approaching Valentine's Day. People are so intrigued by tales of love, and especially if there's the element of haunting tragedy. All of these tales have a few different versions, and this can happen when stories are retold over the course of time. The first tale is The Bridge on the Bridge. In Stowe, Vermont, lies a covered bridge called Gold Brook Bridge, or Emily's Bridge, because it's believed to be haunted by a ghost named Emily. There are several versions of how she died on this bridge. One version says that Emily and her boyfriend were meeting at the bridge to elope because her parents didn't approve of their relationship. Her boyfriend never showed up and Emily in her despair hung herself from the rafters of the bridge. Another version says Emily met the man of her dreams and the couple made plans to get married. The day of the wedding had finally arrived and Emily was at the church in her beautiful red wedding dress. She waited and waited and her beloved groom never showed up. Emily, realizing she had been jilted at the altar, got into the family carriage to find him. While traveling in a frenzy of anger and sorrow, she mercilessly whipped the horses until they were traveling at an incredible pace. Because of this, she lost control of the horses and wasn't able to make the turn on the bridge in time. She and the horses ended up going over the bank and plummeted to their deaths in the rocky brook below. In yet another version, Emily was said to be riding her horse, who became startled while on the bridge and threw Emily onto the rocks in the brook. She's also rumored to have been killed by her future mother-in-law. Visitors to the bridge have reported scratch marks on their cars, bodies, and strange noises such as footsteps, ropes tightening, and a girl screaming. If you park your car on the bridge, you may hear banging on the car or her feet dangling on your car's roof. People from all over visit Emily's Bridge because of the alleged supernatural activity that takes place there, but many believe that the story of Emily is a fabricated one since there is no record of her existence. True or not, it is a sad tale. Our second story is about a deathly love triangle. The Castillo or Castle de San Marcos in St. Augustine, Florida is the oldest masonry fort in the United States. The site is brimming with paranormal activity. In July of 1784, after the English gave back the fortress to the Spanish, a new commander, Colonel Garcia Marti, brought his pretty young wife Dolores to the fort so that they could start their new life there together. This was an arranged marriage, so the colonel was much older than Dolores. Marty was a busy man with a humorless personality who ignored his charming wife. Dolores, in contrast, was well-liked and quickly made friends in St. Augustine. It wasn't long before Dolores took notice of her husband's tall and handsome assistant, Captain Manuel Abella. 
The captain immediately befriended Dolores and their friendship quickly evolved into feelings and both ended up falling in love and started a secret love affair. One day while Captain Abella was giving Colonel Marty his report, he noticed that the captain's uniform reeked of his wife's unique perfume. Shortly afterwards, both Dolores and Manuel went missing. The captain's men noticed that he hadn't shown up for the daily call, and when they questioned Colonel Marti, he told them that he had been given a special mission in Cuba. Later on at a dinner party, the colonel was questioned about his wife's whereabouts. He informed her friends that she had returned to Spain because St. Augustine's climate had been detrimental to her health. The guests questioned this explanation because Dolores had always appeared to be happy and in the best of health. When Captain Manuel never returned, it caused a stir among his men, but no one dared question the commander's story. Fifty years later, in 1833, when a curious soldier, Lieutenant Tuttle, was studying the architecture of the dungeon at the fortress, he noticed a hollow sound in the wall. When he removed a brick, a rush of air hit his face. He proceeded to take down the false wall, brick by brick, and discovered a hidden room. He saw two skeletons that were chained to the back wall. They were found to be the skeletons of a male and a female. It's believed that Colonel Marti, in a fit of rage and jealousy, had Captain Abella and Dolores chained and entombed there to end their lives. Since this discovery, a strong aroma of perfume has been noticed at the dungeon. Sightings of a female apparition with a white dress have been reported on the site, many believing that it's Dolores. Our third tragic tale, A Forbidden Love, takes place in Forrester, Michigan. Minnie was the 15-year-old daughter of Marianne and James Quay. Her family owned a tavern during the lumbering years in the late 1800s. Ships frequently docked in Forrester. Boats were seen coming and going in and out of town. Young Minnie ended up falling in love with one of the sailors that worked on the ships. Her parents not wanting her involved with a sailor disapproved of her crush and their friendship, so they forbade her from seeing him. She was unable to say goodbye to him his last time there. One version of this tale is that word came into town that the sailor's ship sank. Minnie, distraught because her parents had forbidden her to say goodbye or communicate with him, walked out of her home and toward the waterfront. People near the Tanner House, the town inn, waved as she walked by. Suddenly, their faces turned to expressions of horror as she walked into Lake Huron. Another version is that she walked through the center of town then walked out to the end of the pier and jumped into the icy waters of the lake on April 27, 1876. She is said to walk the shoreline waiting for her lover. More frightening accounts say that she lures young girls towards the water to their deaths. Last but not least, we have our fourth tale, a romantic murder plot. Jesse Strang deserted his wife and children, believing that she was unfaithful. After some travel, he ended up in Albany, New York, looking for work and to start a new life. 
Jesse ended up meeting Elsie Whipple in a tavern. She was the daughter of Abraham Lansing and Elsie Van Rensely. Elsie was already married and wife to John Whipple. Strang took on a job as a handyman under the name of Joseph Horton in Cherry Hill at the residence of the Van Rensselaers, Elsie's parents. Elsie and Jesse quickly fell in love. Elsie was unhappy in her marriage because she was controlled and domineered by her husband, John Whipple. Elsie and Jesse communicated by passing letters with the help of the staff of the household. Elsie decided rather than get divorced, the best thing to do was to kill her husband, John, and run away with Jesse. Elsie believed that their love would flourish with her husband out of the way. She conspired with a reluctant Jesse to poison his tea with arsenic so they could run away and elope. This attempt failed and John survived the poisoning. John Whipple, becoming suspicious, kept a loaded gun. In May of 1827, Elsie stole the bullet from his gun and gave it to Strang. Once again, she pressured him to participate in a plot to kill her husband. Eventually, he gave in. On the night of the murder, he climbed onto the roof of the shed and using his own rifle, shot and killed John Whipple. Strang then ran immediately to a local shop in order to secure an alibi. He then returned to Cherry Hill and helped the doctor remove the bullet from John Whipple's body. Jesse quickly became a suspect and the police ruled that he could have traveled a mile from Cherry Hill to the store, so they detained him under suspicion of murder. Upon capture, a fearful Strang, hoping for a lighter sentence, confessed and blamed Elsie for the conception of the plan. This led to Elsie's incarceration. Jesse and Elsie did try to hide their murder plot, but didn't cover the tracks very well. The lovers might have gotten away with the murder plot as they had planned to escape to Montreal, Canada. Jesse Strang, having confessed to the murder, told the prosecutors where to find the rifle. He believed that if Elsie was convicted as well, that her powerful family connections would get them both pardoned, so he laid the blame on her. Jesse asked his lawyer, Calvin Pepper, to plant documents at Cherry Hill, incriminating Elsie as the mastermind behind the plan as he had burned the letters she had sent to him. Pepper refused and told him that nothing he did would give him a lighter sentence. Members of the household testified that they had heard Strang spread rumors of prowlers who were out to kill John Whipple. True to Jesse's suspicions, Elsie was portrayed as a victim, even though she purchased a rifle and removed the curtain from John's room so that Jesse could shoot him. At Strang's trial, the district attorney was Edward Livingston, a relative to the Van Rensselaers and Lansings, who told Jesse to his face, you are guilty. You must be convicted and you must die. Presiding Judge Dewar called Jesse a serpent and a fiend. I have linked my video, Divine Serpent, in the description if you're interested in having a better understanding of this term as it relates to the serpent. When the judge asked the jury to deliberate, they did so for less than 15 minutes before pronouncing Jesse guilty of murder. Three days after Strang's trial, Elsie stood trial for aiding and abetting the murder of her husband. In four days, Elsie was pronounced not guilty and cleared of all the charges. 
After Strang finished testifying at Elsie's trial, Jesse was sentenced to death by hanging. In another version of this tale, Elsie's trial followed the same course as Strang's, except the prosecution tried to call Strang as a witness. There was much debate over his eligibility to testify because he had been convicted but not yet sentenced. In the end, the judge wouldn't allow his testimony. The prosecution rested and the jury, without leaving their seats, acquitted Elsie Whipple. So there's a version where he testifies as a witness in Elsie's trial and one where he doesn't. It's hard to determine which story is true either way. He was convicted and Elsie wasn't. The Albany establishment had closed ranks to save one of their own from a public hanging. Jesse Strang was found guilty of first-degree murder and Elsie Whipple was found not guilty. According to an Albany tourist site, all members of this love triangle roam the halls of Cherry Hill. People have witnessed a ghost on the bottom floor of Cherry Hill and believe it is Mr. Whipple. He's not hostile, but gives off a feeling of anger. Jesse Strang's ghost is seen where the gallows once stood, wearing the same clothes he wore the day of his execution. All four of these tales ended not only in tragedy, but in death and all because of love. Unrequited love by death with an unhappy ending. Passionate love often ends in tragedy, and not all love stories end with a happily ever after. Tragic events and unfinished business have been known to leave spirits wandering the earth. Some of these traumatic occurrences can leave a strong impression as the manifestation of a ghost or a haunting. Why, as human beings, do we seem to be so intrigued by tragedy when it's connected to love? Isn't love and being in love supposed to be the pinnacle of all human existence? We watch movies, read books, and hear stories expecting, hoping that love will end happily. The thing about tragedy is that it tells a tale. We love stories because they're interesting, we learn from them, and relate to them on a personal level. We understand that no matter how powerful that feeling of love is, things can go wrong because we are fallible as human beings in the best and worst of circumstances. With all the love that two human beings can possess, expectation doesn't always predict a happy ending. All tragedy has the capacity to break you down and destroy you or build you up and empower you. It's always a positive when you can come back and overcome the dark place that the devastation of heartbreak can bring you. Tragedy, whether it's a love story or otherwise, can teach us how to work through our emotions and how to better deal with our own feelings. It can build character. Tragedy can be a teacher if you live long enough to experience it, unlike in these tales. While being in love can be absolutely exhilarating and euphoric, it can also debilitate you. Tragedy provides catharsis. When hearing a tragic love story, you empathize with the pain, with the characters, because we've all experienced love. Overall, love gives you the ability to endure things you never thought you could. Tragedy is part of life and we can all relate to it. Love encompasses both joy and sorrow. Falling in love is like holding a candle. Initially, it lightens up the world around you. Then it starts melting and hurts you. Finally, it goes off and everything is darker than ever and all you are left with is the burn. I want to end by saying, 
is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Why do you think people are so fascinated by tragedy as it relates to love? Why are there so many tragic love tales from books to movies and stories all over the world? Your comments, thoughts, and opinions are appreciated. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, happy Valentine's Day, and thank you for watching.